Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inusor Education. Um, I will um, start a new series of lectures about light. Um, general name is Light in Action. That's on the menu in on Unizor.com. Um, but this particular lecture, it's the beginning of these um, three or four lectures. Um, you see, light in action means light should do something, right? And for this, light needs energy. So today we will talk about energy carried by light. I will quantitatively evaluate it. Now, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens, presented on Unizor.com. I suggest you to watch this lecture from this website, because the website has menu, and this lecture is part of the course, which means everything is interconnected. And uh, in this lecture, for example, I'm referring to some other lectures in the same course, um, which contains certain um, material which I will definitely use. Um, there is also Mass for Teens on the same website. This is a prerequisite course. Uh, you need mathematics to, to study physics, no doubts about that. Especially calculus, vector algebra. So, <coughs> I recommend you to watch this lecture and all others from the website, from the unizor.com. Uh, also, every lecture on this website has textual um, material, notes. Basically, every lecture has a, like a piece of textbook next to it. So you can watch the lecture and you can read the text, which is basically textbook, kind of a text. Um, okay, so let's start. Okay, um, I will definitely be based on certain information which I have already presented in some other lectures. For example, we were talking about energy carried by electromagnetic field, general electromagnetic field. It can be constant, it can be variable, doesn't really matter. Um, and we were evaluating the amount of energy in um, it's called density actually uh, energy density of the electromagnetic field um, which is basically a local characteristic which depends on electric um, uh, electric field intensity which is usually um, uh, used the letter E and the magnetic field intensity. Now, <coughs> based on these two local characteristics, magnetic and um, magnetic and electric field intensities, we have come to basically um, variation of the energy density inside. Um, it's it's inside the unit of uh, volume in unit of time. That that's what it is. So if you have an electro electromagnetic field, you can have certain energy, which is um, in some volume. And then if you, if you squeeze the volume down to a point, you will have the energy density, right? So you divide energy by volume, and then you limit volume um, to, to to zero. Um, so this energy density for electric field was at any moment time, at any point x, y, z, electric field has this amount of energy in that particular density, energy density in that particular point where epsilon is electric permittivity and E is um, electric field um, intensity. Magnetic component, very similarly, again, B is the value of magnetic field component of the electromagnetic field intensity 
at moment t at point x, y, z. Mu is magnetic uh, permeability. And this is, as I was saying, magnetic field density at that particular point in time and space. Now, their sum is a total energy density of electromagnetic field. So electromagnetic field carries this energy. All this was presented before in the course when I was talking about electromagnetic field uh, and its properties. That's where uh, Maxwell equations were introduced. Um, so it's all part of the course which has been already covered. <coughs> now, what is light? Well, we again, in that particular part, we were talking about James Maxwell and his experiments, etc. And according to his calculations, light had exactly the same speed as the speed of propagation of electromagnetic um, waves, which, from his opinion, um, was a very important um, argument in favor of light being basically nothing but oscillations of the electromagnetic field, which happened to be, you know, confirmed by many experiments and theoretical researches. So, electromagnetic field carries this energy. So, light is electromagnetic field oscillation, so light carries energy. Okay, that's great, and now we can actually think about how to quantitatively evaluate it. Okay. Now, we will obviously start from a very simple model. Simple model is as follows. <coughs> so our system of coordinates will be something like this, x, y, z. Now the light will go, let's say down, doesn't really matter. So here we have some kind of an area where the light falls on. And um, my ultimate goal is to evaluate amount of light which falls onto this area depending on the area uh, quantitative expression for area and amount of time during which I am basically measuring how much energy I am getting. So I have certain area A, I have time T and I want to know how much energy is falling onto this area um, during this time t. Obviously I have to simplify my model as much as possible so I'm assuming that the light which goes down contains parallel rays and they're all in sync and they're all monochromatic which means they all have exactly the same frequency frequency is omega and the um, the, the area is vacuum, so I know the speed of light, which is C. Um, and basically, I would like to express amount of energy in terms of omega and C. Now, to simplify it even further, what I will do is, I will single out one particular ray of light and I would like to know how much energy is carried by this one particular ray of light, but not in an entire energy. I mean, an entire energy probably would be infinite. If there is an infinite source of light, then the oscillations of this ray will be basically infinite. And I would like to know only one wave, one wavelength of this ray. So I have a ray and its oscillations of magnetic field and electric field and I would like to have only one wave the amount of energy which is um, carried by one wavelength of one single ray of light 
then knowing that I will obviously divide this length by how many um, wave wavelengths fit into this length multiply by this and multiply by area and that's how I will get the total amount of energy I need so right now we're talking only about one wavelength of one single ray of light okay now <coughs> based on uh, expressions which I have already <coughs> presented and magnetic the same thing Now, when, that, when, when we are talking about one particular ray, and obviously we assume that these are synchronous uh, oscillations of electromagnetic field, and we are always presuming, again, for simplicity, and that's probably true, that these oscillations are harmonic, which means our E of t x y z is equal to so this is electric field intensity they are oscillating and they're harmonic oscillations which means it's e zero times cosine of omega t minus z over c and let me explain you why I put it this way. <coughs> if you have some kind of a source of light, and then the light goes down, let's say, and we were actually talking about the axis that we go down Z. This is X and this is Y. Okay, So it goes down. All uh, rays of lights are parallel, so one single ray doesn't really matter what X and Y characteristics it has. Um, it does not depend. It goes down, and the oscillations are electrical oscillations are um, perpendicular to Z and in the direction of the X axis. So these will be electrical oscillations, and these would be magnetic oscillations which are um, towards the y-axis but the whole waves are going down so one wavelength from here to here contains one wave of electric and one wave of magnetic oscillations and both are sinusoidal now why did I put it this way well let's assume that in the beginning where the source of light is the um, electrical will be cosine omega t now that's something which is familiar this is the regular oscillations uh, harmonic oscillations that's the source of light now by the time it goes the distance z the oscillations at this particular point will be exactly the same as oscillations at this point but with a delay and what is delay? delay is the time it takes to cover the distance for the wave so if c is the speed of propagation and z is the distance then z divided by c would be the time delay and that's why I subtracted from t this time delay so the oscillations at point z would look exactly like oscillations at point zero z equal to zero let's say it's here but with this particular time delay so this is a general formula again we were addressing this formula many times before when talking about electromagnetic oscillations and rope oscillations actually I didn't want to start from electromagnetic I started with rope when you're just moving the uh, one end of rope up and down the waves are going all the way 
So all these formulas were addressed before. So I assume this is my um, electric component, so it does not depend on x and y, only on z. E0 is um, amplitude, and uh, in these particular cases I will use epsilon 0 and mu 0. Uh, these are electric permittivity of vacuum, and this is magnetic permeability of vacuum. So we are assuming that we are in a vacuum. So we are simplifying our problems as much as possible. So it's a vacuum, it's a single ray of light, and that's how its electric component um, looks like. And this is magnetic component. By the way, magnetic and electric are always connected, and they're always in sync with each other. <coughs> okay. Let me change my marker. So, knowing this, what I have to do is how do I calculate the amount of energy? Now, this is energy in one, and this is energy in another component of electromagnetic field. But these are densities at point in time and in space. Now, let's forget about time, let's fix the point in time and just think about space. Right? So, my wave goes like this. And I have to calculate... Now, these are E and, and, and B. They are basically the same. <coughs> with different um, amplitude. Now, this is the length... Wavelengths. Lambda. Okay? Let's say from zero to zero, or from peak to peak, doesn't really matter. Um, now, this wavelength, to, to find the amount of energy, I have to basically integrate all the energy here. I know the density, energy density at each point. So, this is my z axis, right? So, it propagates along the z axis. So I know what the uh, electric and uh, magnetic components at every point. So how can I find out the total amount of energy which is in one particular wavelength? Well, I have to integrate, basically, from 0 to lambda. 1 half epsilon 0 e square, which is e0 square cosine, cosine square of omega t minus z over c dz. That's my electrical component. <coughs> energy, electrical energy. And uh, magnetic energy would be similar, but instead of epsilon 0, I will have 1 over mu 0, and instead of e0, I will have b0. So I have to really take these two integrals and their sum would be amount of energy, electric and magnetic energy, concentrated in one particular wavelength of one single ray of light. Okay? <coughs> now let's talk about lambda. What is lambda? Lambda is a wavelength. So we have many different characteristics of waves. We have lambda, which is the wavelength. We have c, which is the speed of propagation. We have tau, which is a period. Now, period is the time which 
is needed for a wave to cover the distance equal to wavelengths, right? That's the period, which means that lambda is equal to c times tau. Okay. Now, what else do we have? One thing is period. Another is how many oscillations per second, so how many periods per second uh, uh, fits. That's frequency. Frequency is equal to 1 over tau. So if tau is amount of time needed for one wave, so how many waves are per second? You basically divide 1 by tau, right? And we have omega, which is not number of oscillations per second, but it's number, uh, this is an angular frequency, which means I have to multiply number of oscillations by 2 pi, right? So that's an angular, which is 2 pi f. Now, I would like to express my lambda in terms of omega and c. So instead of tau, I will put c over f, and instead of f, I will put omega divided by 2p, 2 pi. So it would be c, uh, omega, and 2 pi. Okay? So lambda is equal to two pi c over omega. That's the same thing as we see, right? Now, what do we have? We have one half epsilon zero uh, e zero squared cosine omega t minus z c d z, right? So, um, let me open these parentheses. I will put separately omega t minus omega z. What's interesting here is that if I will replace omega z over c as u, so I will have here u, I will have here, if z is from 0 to 2 pi c over, uh, over omega, then omega divided by c would be from 0 to 2 pi, right? So integral for 0 to 2 pi for u. So that would be one half epsilon zero e zero square cosine square square of omega t minus u. And instead of dz I have to put du uh, c over omega. So c over omega du. Okay, this is much simpler integral, obviously. Um, it's very easy actually to, to calculate it. Um, but there is a kind of a more mathematical way. You uh, replace cosine square with um, what's the formula? Cosine square is equal to 1 plus 2, two cosine 2 square Two of two angles. Yeah, let me check it. Cosine square minus sine square. This is cosine of double angle, right? Phi. So sine square is one minus cosine square. So it's two cosine square minus one. Right. So it's one plus cosine of two phi divided by two, and that really get get rid of the square here, and then you know take whatever the integral from a cosine, that's very simple. All these calculations I put in the notes for this lecture. However, there is kind of a trick here which might actually help. You see cosine square and sine square are really not much different if we are talking about one period. It's just shifted. So the um, integral of one should be equal to integral to another. But if we will add them and uh, add them together, you will have one. So that actually gives you that integral of cosine is equal to or co cosine square is equal to integral basically of without cosine square equal to one divided by two, 
and I can give you right now the answer again either you do it yourself or you will take a look at the notes these integrals are really kind of trivial and I don't want to spend much time on this I will give you the answer as I have already calculated E0 square. And here, more or less similar, pi C omega B square. So, their sum which is equal to one half pi over C over omega epsilon zero e zero square plus one over mu zero b square that's energy of one particular <coughs> uh, wavelengths of the ray again that's energy of one lambda wavelengths okay now it's simpler <coughs> so if you have certain area again let me go back to my picture this is area and this is the time so this cylinder contains all the energy which falls <coughs> onto this area during this time what's the height of the cylinder if t is time, then t times speed of light, the speed of propagation of waves, is the height of the cylinder. Now, we know one ray of one wavelength. So, what should we do now? We should multiply this, this. You should multiply it by what? How many waves fit in the height which is c times t divided by um, lambda and multiply by area that's my total amount of energy falling onto area a during the time t okay now what did they say about lambda Remember, lambda is c times tau, which is c divided by f, and this is c divided by omega and times 2 pi, right? So this is a times t times c divided by lambda, which means divided by 2 pi c and multiplied by omega and W A T right A times T times Omega to Pi and this is my so it's one half Pi C divided by Omega Epsilon zero z zero square plus mu zero b zero square. This is total amount of energy which is falling. Now this is not really a very convenient way of presenting this. It's much better to say what's the density of the energy and density of the energy is basically the same thing divided by a and divided by t so how much energy falls onto unit of area during unit of time 
Now, if you have these, um, then whenever you have any area and any amount of time, you just multiply it by area by time, and you will get the result. So the density of energy, I don't know, I'll call it PAT, how much energy per unit of time, now I, I shouldn't really have these indices, per unit of time, per unit of area, that's equal to one quarter um, epsilon zero E zero square plus uh, one over zero. one over mu zero b zero square plus so this is the result this is something which is which can be used for any kind of calculations if you know the amplitude of electric and um, magnetic fields that's basic I think I missed something did I miss something I think I missed C let me check. Yeah, I missed C, so it should be C. I forgot. C did not. Omega and pi, I actually cancelled down, but C remained. Yeah. And I think I call it the letter I for intensity of the light. Intensity of the light, amount of energy falling onto unit of area perpendicularly to the light during unit of time okay that that's basically what it is yes i forgot to see all right now i would like to simplify it a little bit further i need e and b i need electrical component and magnetic component actually for the harmonic oscillations we can express let's say b over e in terms of e and here is how again i'm referring you to um the lectures about electromagnetic field in general that's where i covered uh, maxwell equations and one of the equations general equations for any magnetic electromagnetic field was minus d B Y C Z by D Z equals epsilon zero mu zero Z of X Okay, now, what is this? This is a simplified version of Maxwell equation for vacuum. Easy, uh, epsilon zero and mu zero are permittivity and permeability of, uh, of the vacuum. Now, B is magnetic component, E is electric component. Now, these indices were used in that presentation just to show that the direction of propagation of the waves is Z direction of electric component is um, oscillations over the x-axis and um, magnetic components again let me just draw this picture x y z so the wave wave goes this way now electric component is parallel to x and magnetic component is parallel to y and they are perpendicular to each other. So that's basically the picture, and that's what kind of an equation we have. This is the fourth Maxwell equation, and in our case I can actually drop these indexes because we don't really need them. We know that x, in our concrete example, we have postulated that x is direction of um, changing electric component and y is electric uh, magnetic component. So these are the same. Now, let's use this for our particular case when e of tz is equal to e0 times 
cosine of omega t minus z over c. And b, correspondingly, is exactly the same. v0 times cosine, same thing. All right, so let's differentiate b by z. So that would be what? Um, so minus db of tz by dz. So this is my b. So what is it? Minus. OK, now um, the constant goes out, b0. Um, derivative of cosine is sine with a minus sign, so I put plus here and sine of omega t minus z over c times um, derivative of inner function. Uh, inner function we are calculating by z, so it's omega over c. That's my um, derivative. Now here we have epsilon zero mu zero g e of t z by d t equals okay epsilon zero mu zero remains um, e mu e zero is constant um, derivative of um, I think in this case it's not just W over C, I think it's minus W over C. Sorry. Minus. Now here I have sign, but with a minus sign, so let me put minus in front. Minus sign of the same thing. times inner function, which is again minus omega c over omega over c. Okay. <coughs> and minus. So that's negative. And here we have minus sine I'm sorry. I'm not multiplying by derivative by z. We are multiplying derivative by t. Is by t. So it's omega. I see something is wrong. OK. And they are equal to each other. OK. Great. That's how we will derive. They are equal to each other. And that's how we derive dependency between B0 and E0. Right? So this is minus. And this is minus. So what we can have is b0 times omega over c is equal to epsilon 0 mu 0 omega e. Am I right? Now, again, in the same lecture, we were deriving the speed of light as 1 over square root of epsilon 0 mu 0. See, I'm always referring you to the previous. That's why you really have to take the course and not just listen to this particular lecture, from which c square is equal to 1 over epsilon mu 0. So, here I can actually change this to 1 over c square. Now this goes out 
and this goes out and what do I have? I have E0 equals CB0 such a simple dependency between them if we are talking about harmonic oscillations and we are talking about um, monochromatic light without and in vacuum etc so all is clean which basically allows us to change slightly our equation so again so we can do instead of b0 square I can put i is equal to c over 4 uh, epsilon e0 square plus 1 over nu b square which is c square uh, no b is e divided okay c square would be here and we will have e there <coughs> now this can be simplified even further since c square is equal to 1 over epsilon 0 mu 0 mu 0 is equal to what? mu 0 is equal to 1 over epsilon 0 c square, right? so mu 0 times c square is equal to 1 over epsilon 0 and 1 over mu c square is equal to epsilon 0 so instead of this I can write this epsilon 0 e0 zero square plus epsilon 0 e0 zero plus which is equal to this is the same thing right so it's true so it's c over 2 epsilon 0 e0 zero square and this is my total formula for density of light amount of energy light carries of this amplitude um, when it falls on some flat surface per unit of area per unit of time that's what density actually is very simple formula well as everything else in real life real life is much more complex um, light is never monochromatic unless it's a laser light and uh, well in any case whatever it is we are talking about as always we are talking about model and our, our model has allowed us to relatively simply express the amount of energy uh, which light carries in this case it's monochromatic light which has the same amplitude um, it's harmonic oscillation, C is the speed of light, epsilon zero is um, electric permittivity of the, of the vacuum so that's what it is um, I do suggest you to read the notes for this lecture again and whenever I'm referring to prior material in the course especially when I was talking about general energy of the electromagnetic field um, so I refer to this particular chapter of the course in the notes and I suggest you to read that to refresh your memory it would be great if you go through all the four Maxwell um, equations they are explained in, in detail and um, I think it's presented basically in a rather rigorous um, way so there should be no questions basically remained unanswered I, I don't really put something and tell you okay that's what it is just believe me I'm trying to put everything with a proof so I do suggest you to review that particular chapter of the course 
And this is just a direct consequence of that. So that's the amount of light which can be used, this one, when we are investigating basically what the light can do. And that will be in the next lectures. So that's it for today. Thank you very much and good luck.